Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Ian Gary. I'm a professor in the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today uh, to kick off our uh, President's Lecture Series for this year. Uh, we will hear a talk given by Dr. Jennifer Johnston entitled Mass Shootings and Media Contagion. Uh, can everyone hear me okay with the mic? Okay, I'll hold it about here. Um, so just before we get started uh, with Dr. Johnston, I did have a few uh, housekeeping things to, uh, to cover, so some, um, some acknowledgements and some announcements. So first off, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of the people uh, whose work has made the lecture series possible. So starting with the committee members besides myself, uh, Melanie Chaparian, Chandra Hodgson, and Nathan Radke. Uh, Humber's media service technicians who are working away at the back there and were responsible for that fine Chemical Brothers inspired video you just saw. Um, the president's executive assistant, Deborah Green, and executive uh, receptionist, Jessica Camara. And of course, none of this would be possible without Humber's president, Chris Whitaker, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, uh, but whose support we appreciate very much. So, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to plug some of our upcoming talks in the series. Uh, so on Thursday, November the 1st at 1 p.m. in this very room, we will hear from Timothy Caulfield, who is a Canada Research Chair in Health Law and Policy and Professor in the Faculty of Law and School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. Uh, he's become quite well known for uh, debunking certain um, myths and assumptions, uh, particularly to do with uh, uh, health innovation, and uh, he's going to deliver a talk called Science versus Celebrity Culture, A Battle We Must Win. So I hope you can join us for that. And then on Thursday, November the 22nd at 1 p.m. at the Lakeshore campus, we will hear from uh, Vince Calderhead. Uh, he's someone who spent 31 years with uh, Nova Scotia Legal Aid, and he now has a full-time gig with a private company. Uh, who pays him to work entirely pro bono, um, basically taking on cases that uh, challenge existing laws, policies, or practices uh, that infringe on the rights of the poor. Uh, so basically, a lot of those cases have to do with uh, a human rights or a charter of rights uh, type of dimension. So that one will be at the Lakeshore campus in the uh, community room, and his talk is called All Reasonable Roads Lead to the Elimination of Poverty. So maybe you can make it to that one. Uh, if you can't, well, I have good news in that we have an archive. So if you go to our uh, lecture series website, you'll be able to find a link to the archive. You'll be able to watch uh, today's talk over again and many, many talks that stretch back uh, into the mists of time. Um, probably the easiest way to find us actually is just to Google Humber President's Lecture Series. Uh, you can also watch for our advertising in places like uh, the Humber Communique, Humber Today, Humber TV, Ignite bulletin boards all over the college, and of course, where would we be without social media? Uh, so I would like to take this opportunity as well to welcome everyone who is watching via live stream at the Lakeshore and Orangeville campuses, and I would like to extend a special welcome to students in attendance today studying issues in crime with Professor Alex Schwartz, as well as students in uh, the Introduction to College Reading and Writing Skills uh, studying with Professor Chandra Hodgson. Speaking of Chandra Hodgson, um, my capable colleague on the committee uh, will actually be conducting a Q&A session following uh, today's talk. So if you can stick around for that, uh, that will be very good. Um, what we will ask you to do during the Q&A is just what I'm doing now, uh, which is to speak into this microphone. And that's basically just so uh, folks watching remotely can hear you and, and on the archive will be able to hear you. All right. And following the talk, we will have a little reception at which some light refreshments will be served. So lunch is on us. If you uh, are able to stick around, we would encourage you to do that, and you can carry on uh, the conversation a little bit further, a bit more informally. So um, quick show of hands, how many people have a cell phone with them today? Oh, really, that many. Um, so we're going to conduct a little um, psychological experiment in keeping with our, our uh, speaker today. Um, it's a practice and impulse control. We'll see how long you can't look at it. <laughs> or at least make sure that it is silenced uh, for the duration of the talk. We would very much uh, appreciate that. Um, so I would like to turn the floor over 
now to a student in uh, Dr. Schwartz's uh, Issues in Crime class, uh, Sade Notice, and she is going to introduce today's speaker. Come on up, Sade. Dr. Jennifer Johnson is a media psychologist and assistant professor of psychology at Western New Mexico University, where she has served as a member of the Strategic Discourse Analysis Research Group. Previous to this, she was a research fellow with the Institute for Social Innovation at Fielding Graduate University and a member of the Cross-Cultural Pornography Effects Research Team at the University of Zagreb in Croatia. Dr. Johnson has published research on the relationship between viewing of pornography, and later sexual satisfaction, as well as the media's role in the increased prevalence of mass shootings. Her research on the media's contagion effect, which examines the role that fame-seeking plays in mass homicide, has been widely covered in national and international newspapers, radio, and television. She has presented at the American Psychological Association, the International Communication Association, the International Family Violence and Child Victimization Research Conference, among others. Most recently, she was invited to talk about the impact of media contagion on school shootings before the United States Federal School Safety Commission. We are very pleased to have her participate in our series today. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Johnson. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me. It's a thrill to be here. I have actually never been in Canada before, which is sad to say. Um, other than there was once a flight routed me through Toronto and back home again, but this is my first time really on the soil. So thank you, it's wonderfully uh, beautiful and diverse and um, you have a big beautiful campus too that I was rather lost in for a while, but here we are. Uh, so I come from the other end of the, the United States, right near the border of Mexico is where our university is located, and uh, that's where I've been working with students and conducting research. So I'll get right to it, though. There's a lot to cover today, but thank you for having me. All right, clicker. I don't know where I aim it. It's not always at the screen. Yep, that worked. Uh, so let's start with the definition of mass shooting. It has shifted a little bit. We use the FBI definitions, um, and so this is why when we talk a little bit later about prevalence rates, it matters how are you counting mass shootings. Um, if there, it, prior to 2000, the general uh, rule of thumb for the FBI to consider something a mass homicide or a mass shooting was four or more fatalities uh, had to have occurred. After that, they moved it to about three or more fatalities. And finally, um, in more recent years, we're defining mass shooting a little bit differently because it has to do with how we collect statistics and what we understand about this phenomenon. So we refer to these more as active shooting incidents, and we don't uh, move a shooting out of the classification of a mass shooting just because there weren't fatalities. If there was an attempt made um, to kill people and uh, many people, then we consider that an active shooting event. So it's hard sometimes to compare data from before 2000 to now because of that, although some people have made some valiant efforts. Uh, so the key things that we're looking at are that these are not familial types of homicide where multiple people are killed, but it's they're well known to the shooter. Um, they're usually done in a public place, uh, can be considered random, or the victims involved are unknown to the shooter, and um, that there was an attempt to kill multiple people in a short amount of time. All right, um, so, pr oh, I have to double click, I think. I'm going backwards, apparently, sorry. <laughs> Here we go. So one of the main questions I started with in looking at this was, is the prevalence increasing? If it's not, then it may, throw out this whole idea that there could be a me media contagion effect. So um, a few efforts to catalog the type and prevalence of mass shootings have been conducted, but either the authors did not have access to the FBI crime data or only the parts of it that were publicly available. 
And they were including, as I mentioned before, like home or family-based murders, terrorist plots in those data sets when talking about prevalence of mass murder. So some of them um, consulted the Virginia Tech Review Panel, that's Appendix L. There's a Mother Jones data set that's been used, a USA Today data set. Um, there's also one that was published in Slate.com. Journalists have done an excellent job trying to catalog these um, events. However, uh, they, they've er erroneously determined that there was not an increase when looking at a number of those data sets. But if we utilize uh, the FBI's data set, and they work in conjunction with the University of Texas at San Marcos, the ALERT uh, res uh, research team, and th when you look at active shooting incidents, as were defined earlier, um, time does explain about 80% of the variance in the number of events. Uh, and it, two other recent analyses are concurring that mass shootings are definitely on the rise, as well as my own research where we looked at this. And how much on the rise? About a three-fold increase just from the year 2000. So as you can see, a uh, massive difference in the 50 years before the year, year 2000. Of course, these are U.S. numbers. Um, there are other places where we could talk a little bit about um, worldwide, what are some of the incident rates. Uh, in a short span, we saw an increase of seven in its incidents per year in just those first three years after 2000. But at the time, we weren't sure this could just be an anomaly. Let's see what happens. Time goes on. Um, we're seeing a doubling of that of 15 incidents per year. And as you know, well, you may not, but I'm telling you now, last year was a banner year for us in the U.S., unfortunately, with mass shootings. And we hit where the researchers at ALERT suggested that it might level off. According to that regression line, it might level off at 30 incidents per year, but we're already there. It's very disturbing. All right. Um, I want to talk to you about this concept in media psychology that informs a lot of my work, actually. Um, we have an inborn imperative to give great salience to danger in our environment. We pay attention to and carefully remember cues that indicate that someone or somewhere or something might be dangerous to us. Um, obviously, it keeps us alive to, to really pay close attention to signals of danger. This gift of nature has worked beautifully for almost all of human history. And until about 100 years ago, we remembered the stories of danger and warning uh, from those we met personally face to face. And we learned what to avoid in our small communities and natural environments because we trusted the people we knew. We trusted those we met who seemed most like ourselves. We believed them, emulated them, and heeded their advice. Now, admittedly, this led to some si social psychological fallout, like the tendency to stereotype and segregate and discriminate against anyone who was different from ourselves. Um, and we sometimes dismiss people who are outside of our closed circle of family and friends um, just because we don't know them and they're different. But when the advent of mediated images and information at the beginning of last century started, uh, our danger salience neurology had to decide if this new version of information sharing would be governed by the same socially primed rules that it always had been. Uh, would we immediately dismiss all people and their perspectives portrayed in the media just because we did not personally know them? Uh, our, neur our neurology, in fact, did not decide. It simply continued to react as though mediated information given to it by human sounding voices and human looking images was similarly valenced and should be similarly valued as if the information had come from a flesh and blood human being standing before it. All right, let's, well, and this way I might need a little help with IT. Are you going to load the video for me? But let's take a look. What's it like to see mediated imagery? How real does it feel to you? And there's some sound with this. <laughs>
right, so what we find is that if we had hooked all of you up to EEG machines and been monitoring your skin galvanic response and your heart rate and your blood pressure, it would have changed in somewhat similar fashion as the people who were actually on that roller coaster. Um, media has an incredibly power powerful effect, especially on the lower systems of the brainstem, the medulla, the cerebellum, the limbic system, our earlier kind of evolutionary brain. And we don't have time to change how we're reacting to mediated imagery fast enough with our cortical brain. It's a bit slower, just a little bit slower in processing than those other parts of our brain. So we do act as if, and much of our system reacts as though media is real life. There's a lot of implications for this. Um, So when a mediated voice or image sounds and looks most like our own kind, most like ourselves, we like it more, we trust it more, we emulate it more, and we may believe it more. If it looks and dresses and sounds like an authority, as that is defined in our own individual cultures, uh, it, then we tend to react to it like it's an authority and believe more what there is to be said. So um, we can override the information that comes in from other sensory processing centers and tell ourselves that something's not real, but that doesn't mean that it's not affecting us in a similar way as if someone that we were close to or cared about or were interested in had shared information with us. So let's talk a little bit about parasocial relationships. So this was uh, thanks to a graduate student who was really thinking about, if you remember back to a classic psychology study of Solomon Ash and people in a room having to judge uh, the different lengths of lines and this idea that they would conform to what most other people in the room were doing um, unless they had an ally, someone else in the room who also saw it the way that they did. Then they would tend to feel willing to stand up against the group, go against what they had said, and uh, state their own opinion about it. So my, my grad student hypothesized, what if media portrayals of mass shooters, if that mass shooter in the media functions as an ally to a would-be mass shooter, to a, a young person or a person in general who is considering something like that or is feeling similarly, is identifying with this person, what if that's all they need kind of to tip the scales, to step out against the norms, which is not to kill people, and go against the grain? Um, Almost unequivocally, we take film and imagery at face value, perhaps because we know that real people were involved. It's known as the realism factor when we're watching media. We forget that it may be altered imagery. Um, it's probably interrupted clips, scripted, sound bites cut together in ways that regular people would not look or sound. But we don't really remember that when we're seeing it. It looks very real. We become engaged in that. And we can spring up parasocial relationships from this. And what is it? It's a one-way relationship. Oh, you can't see the screen very well. The idea is kind of like if that middle bar is representing the screen between you, you the viewer, and the mediated personality. It can even be an animated character. It, it can be just anthropomorphic in some way. What we found is that you develop, in varying degrees, a similar set of rules that you engage with that other person as you would a real person in a real social relationship. Parasocial, though, the idea that it's one way. So you are bringing to the table with this mediated figure your beliefs, your interests, your concern, your worry for them, um, you're thinking about what they might be doing or who they are, their influence on you. You're kind of having a social relationship to this point, to the screen. They're, of course, not having any relationship with you at all. <laughs> you don't exist for them. But we find that some people are higher in parasocial relating than others. It's a natural tendency. But we decided to test this at our university and did um, an experiment looking at the idea that possibly people who are high in parasocial relating uh, may be more likely to identify with mediated figures and possibly in a hypothetical scenario where they had to give a jail sentence to a mass shooter would identify with them more and maybe go easier on them. So we tested that. All right. Um, let me show you one of our findings. First of all, we found that about a third of our sample was high in parasocial relating. 
And after random assignment to the experimental, experimental versus control group, about equal numbers of high and low parasocial relators were in each group. The experimental group saw a seven-minute news program clip about a real, though previously unknown to the viewers, mass shooter, a news program on them. The control group watched a seven-minute clip on self-driving cars, somewhat boring and neutral. Uh, we found a trend that people who were high in parasocial relating were differentially affected by which video clip they saw when it came to giving a jail sentence to, for a hy hypothetical mass shooter. The high parasocial relators seemed to identify with the mass shooter in the video clip. We're kind of guessing at what was going on in their minds, but we saw this relationship or possibly felt sorry for him. And they gave lower jail sentences than others in the self-driving video uh, control group um, who were also uh, high in parasocial relating. Uh, we saw an interesting kind of opposite effect in people in who were low in parasocial relating. Fave has to do with like favorite character, and that's how we measure parasocial relating with the ASI. Um, and so uh, among people in, who were low in parasocial relating, those who saw the video on the mass shooter seemed to feel either more hostile or more righteous after seeing it because they trended toward higher jail terms. And you can kind of see when there's an X, you know, interaction effect when you cross those, those lines between those different um, bar graphs as well as the, the one that I previously saw showed. Um, so they, they seemed to give higher jail terms than their low parasocial counterparts who were in the control group. Um, so we're seeing people with, you know, both having low parasocial relating, reacting differently depending on what video they saw. We also saw, interestingly, a slightly higher hostility level from all the people that watched the video clip of the mass shooter than the people who didn't. And we know that from other media effects studies um, that, you know, we can temporarily at least increase aggression a bit um, and potentially in this case increase hostility just from watching mass shooters on television. So we're going to try to look into this a little bit more, but we have some concerns um, about what is going on with folks that might be at risk for doing this. And since I'm a psychologist, I also like to understand and look at that profile if there is one. What are some cross-cutting traits um, among mass shooters? What do we know so far? Uh, and this study, we're looking at hostility, narcissism, and social isolation, and whether if you combine that with parasocial relating, it will lead to lower sentencing, or we would hypothesize more identification with a type of ally. Uh, we're still in working on that study. So um, these are the three cross-cutting traits, though, that we identified um, in the last piece of work that we did. There are a number of folks who have had access to mass shooters, uh, as far as interviewing them or their personal belongings, their writings, the things they collect, um, their online presence. And so sometimes that's hard to get access to. But a few authors have. Uh, there's one big study, and, but it's, it's really getting old already. It's from 2002 um, that was commissioned by the FBI for people to look at. Is there a, are there cross-cutting traits? Are, is there a trend among mass shooters? But really that data set was so small. Unfortunately now we have a pretty solid big data set from all of the shootings that have happened since then. So a few other people have kind of tried to look at this. And what emerges is not the mental health issue that you might think. A lot of times what's reported in the news is a speculation that there's mental illness. But what does that mean to a lot of people? A lot of people are thinking, I think, psychosis, someone's out of touch with reality, they're deranged, something like that. And that's not what we find by and large. We have a small percentage of mass shooters that would fit the criteria for those diagnoses, we believe. Um, most of them had not been identified beforehand, but about maybe 10% or less are dealing with psychosis of some kind. And then also a surprising number are dealing with personality disorder, uh, which if you're familiar, the main one that's linked to violence is antisocial personality disorder. And we don't find that to be very common at all among mass shooters. Um, we find that to be very common among single homicide um, assailants and killers. But this is a bit of a different type is what we're seeing. So what emerges as the major mental illness is depression, major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder, um, and to the point of being suicidal. And that's key. We're going to keep coming back to that. 
Uh, but that matters just because it's basically the most common mental disorder that's out there. Uh, up to about 25% of people will experience that at some point in their lifetime. Doesn't mean that it's not real or a valuable mental disorder that we need to look at. Um, another issue that comes up among shooters is the idea that they have recently had a major social loss or um, as Mad Fist likes to describe it, a kind of a loss of social capital. So th they, they're feeling that something important to them has been removed or they've been humiliated or lost a, a job, a major relationship, sometimes even a death. Um, but sometimes it's not a, ma a major kind of loss. It's more that there's been a long-standing pattern of isolation um, or that they've been bullied a lot and they feel ostracized and kind of outside of the groups they want to be part of. Um, and lastly is the component of narcissism. And uh, Reed Malloy has identified elements of this as well as Fine and Reddy in their studies with assassins, um, which I think have more most in common with mass shooters than the single homicide types of perpetrators do. Uh, and so particularly what I've added to this discussion and, and Langford has followed up is the idea that I think they're specifically fame-seeking. And there's a lot of evidence of this. In fact, of all the traits listed above, that was one of the few that came out over and over and over, possibly more than half, more than 75%, have mentioned in some way or you can find evidence in their belongings, their writings, their interviews, that they were seeking fame. Why, I assume, to make up for the other three issues. And that is a, f a form of narcissism. Kind of, It's not just that poor me and things are bad, but... I blame somebody else for this. I blame a whole group or a set of individuals for this problem, and I want to exact revenge on them to possibly bring myself out of this and get back the social capital that I am missing and that I think I deserve. All right, let's talk a little bit about coverage of mass shootings in the media. Are, is it being covered very well? What do you think? <laughs> Is it on, on your minds? Do you know who these folks are? And normally I don't like to show any images, as you may know, of mass shooters or their names in any way. But I wanted to point out what type of coverage we tend to see. So this was a very recent publication. I don't know that you had it here in Canada. But it was on the shelves, like at Walmart, uh, for months. It was an issue, a special issue, dedicated completely, I don't know if it was 50 or 100 pages, just to assassins. And you can tell the coloring, the, the size and imagery of the shooter, and the title alone gives you a sense of like what message is being conveyed here. Like historical figures, people worth remembering. They changed history. Uh, I see this as rather problematic if you are dealing with someone who's thinking, will I be famous if I commit this crime? Will everybody remember my name? Will they always know who I am? Let me ask you this, most of you, if you just think for a second, I don't want you to necessarily say it, but in your mind, what is the name of the Sandy Hook Elementary shooter? You know, most of you know. What is the name of any one of the 20 children who were murdered there? What is the name of any one of the six teachers who were murdered there? We don't know. Parkland, we don't know the names of the victims. We almost never do. But you could probably list off 5, 10, 15 of these killers, and we're playing into something that they really want. Uh, as a contrast, and let's talk about, is, it, is this just an anomaly? Is this rare? Or how much media, get rid of that, um, how much media coverage is really going on? Uh, Dr. Schildkraut, one of my colleagues who's just across the lake here, I suppose, right, uh, in Oswego, uh, so she has done a great deal of research on this. And we, of course, encourage people to use images that are more about victims, first responders, uh, community responses, et cetera. But what is going on and what's been going on? Uh, excellent book, by the way. Highly recommend it. Um, and so a couple of things. Uh, Schildkraut did content analyses of newspaper headings, trying to find out what was the focus of the article, um, just in one major newspaper that's very well known and in the US, and she found that over a 12-year span, any mention of the mass shooting, 60% of those headlines were tied to the killer specifically, 60%. Another interesting content analysis of just imagery was done by another colleague of mine at the University of Oregon, Nicole Dahman, 
And this was very recent, just came out in 2018. So she just looked at three major that were covered in national news, so three major uh, mass shootings just for three days, how many images were portrayed and what were those images of, as well as what was the size of those images in relation to other images. And so in those three days of those three mass shootings in three major newspapers, there were, if I'm not, yeah, about more than 9,000 images. And the ratio of any one killer to any one victim was 16 to 1. Okay, so you're seeing the killer 16 times more often than any one of his victims. Um, we know that there's heavy coverage of the shooters in our media. <coughs> Why might that be? Well, some of you might be interested in doing research and looking into that more. I would suggest or argue that it is probably because the public is a little more comfortable feeling outrage when seeing media than sorrow and suffering. It's harder to stay with the program when it hurts really bad. But when you're kind of like mad and like I said, feeling more hostile and outraged and righteous about it, people stay, they stay glued, they watch longer. And so ratings tend to go up precipitously with coverage of these events. So is there a media contagion? We now have 11 studies that test the contagion effects of mass homicides. One goes as far back as 1971, but most of this research is from the last decade or two. All 11 have found a contagion effect. Including a few outside of the United States. And most were able to directly connect that effect to media coverage. And they did this in various creative um, ways. Some covered TV programs, some covered newspapers, um, some looked at mentions in social media, that kind of thing. So there were a lot of ways that they came about this. Uh, uh, three of the contagion effects were related to suicide contagion or aggravated assault. But eight out of the 11 found a direct contagion from one mass shooting to another mass shooting. The critical time period is what's really interesting that stands out about this. During which mass shootings are most contagious was very consistent across the 11 studies. New incidents are incited almost always within two weeks of the media coverage. Okay, so that's kind of the window that's most vulnerable. It's about that two week to 30 day window um, from one incident being portrayed and then someone being inspired to go ahead and complete maybe what they were just thinking about before within that short period of time. Um, I want to talk for a moment about the last one, Garcia Bernardo out of the University of Vermont. It's the only one that looked at social media. And so it has to do, too, it's not just mass media that is contributing to the contagion. Of course, you'd say maybe unknowingly, except I'm not so sure that they didn't know. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but they looked at social media. What can all of us do? And what is our impact potentially on uh, mass shootings? or school shootings. And what they found after analyzing 58 billion tweets um, and looking for anytime someone used the word shooting or mass shooting or school shooting or mass murder, that uh, their model was statistically significant for finding a con contagion, meaning that if the events are not related, there should be a random pattern across time, right? They should not be related in time. They should not cluster in little time periods. But in fact, they do. And how strong is that contagion effect matters as well. And so when they saw that ma the word mass shooting, or I think in this case with the data I'm about to give you, school shooting was tweeted even only 10 times per million tweets. If it stayed above 10 per million tweets in the days following the shooting, by the ninth day, there was a 50% likelihood that another shooting would occur. And it was regionally tied as well. When tweets stayed above 10 per million for up to 19 days, that rose to 85% certainty that another shooting would occur. That's how tightly they were clustering, and that's how tied it is to how much this is in the consciousness of folks, as well as maybe indicating that idea that you're famous, not just in mass media, but also in social media. Um, how strong is that effect? As those of you that might look at uh, size effects, which are very important in statistics, 
Uh, towers et al., the last two studies here, as well as Garcia Bernardo, it was similar, their strength, but Towers found that it, it's about a 22% strength, kind of the idea that for uh, mass shootings, not school shootings, it's a little weaker, uh, I mean a little bit stronger, wait, I make sure I'm not getting those backwards. School shootings have the uh, slightly weaker effect of about 22%, meaning that uh, there's a cumulative effect that if one shooting happens, there's a likelihood that another will happen in that two-week period. But if a third happens or a fourth, a fifth is nearly guaranteed. So it's about you know a 20% or so um, effect of each shooting adding to the one just before it. With um, shootings not in school settings, they found that effect was even stronger. So uh, by the third shooting, you're guaranteed to have a fourth. So it rises to about 30% of a size effect for um, mass shootings not out in schools. Uh, another interesting fact is that Towers found that in states that had um, the most lax gun laws, they had higher rates of mass shooting, and that was statistically significant as well. I wish I could say I was the first person to come up with this, um, to even coin the phrase media contagion effect um, or media contagion, but really it was... Uh, Dr. Phillips out of the University of San Diego. And I had begun working on this and thought I had read something about suicide contagion. And sure enough, I had. That's kind of what sparked the idea for me. I hadn't read about all of these other studies I didn't know. I had a suspicion. And after reading Phillips' work on suicide contagion many years ago, that possibly mass homicide might also be contagious. And one of the questions is, well, is regular homicide, is, is single homicide contagious? And we find that no, it is not. It, it does not seem to be governed by these similar principles. And again, I think that lends more credence to the idea that fame is such a key part of this. Um, so uh, suicide, I mean, single homicide seems to be differently motivated um, and a somewhat different profile, the kind of people that are doing that. They often have a history of violence, um, and you can see kind of a pattern that leads up to that point. Um, and or they have a history of you know living in a situation and it, it kind of an oppressive environment where they don't have too many options and that's what they're led to. However, mass homicide we don't find that history of violence almost ever in our shooters. Uh, there seem to be kind of a different animal. So what did Phillips had to say as far back as 1980? He did fa check out his work if you want to. It's it's fascinating stuff that he came up with. Murder-suicide stories trigger multiple fatality non-commercial airplane crashes. That was one piece of work that he did. And my data suggests that some commercial airplane accidents may have been triggered by front-page murder-suicide stories. And so he d developed a term for it called, like, culture con um, contagion. And now we refer to this as media contagion. Um, Moving along, uh, who was another one? And Clayton Kramer in 1994 warned, uh, he was a journalist scholar, editors need to ask themselves, how many innocent lives will we sacrifice to boost circulation? Violent crime of all types should be given attention relative to other causes of suffering and proportionate to its social costs. Who else? I just came across another one last week that I didn't know had talked about this as early as 2002. As the study already shows, and as the studies for suicidal behavior show, it may be dangerous to report about amok or rampage type events in a sensational way. The reporting may trigger the same attitude and behavior in persons who found themselves in a similar state of mood. And this is Schmidtke in Europe writing about this. Um, Lastly, I'll share uh, Dr. Gould and Olivares, who have done a nice review of the different media contagion studies. Um, it seems reasonable to worry that heavily mediatized nature of these events will inspire others to engage in similar behaviors and incite further incidents. Um, Zainab Tufekci, she is a sociologist. I'm increasingly concerned that the tornado of media coverage that swirls around each such mass killing and the acute interest in the identity and characteristics of the shooter, as well as the detailed and sensationalist reporting of the killer's steps just before or during the shootings may be creating a vicious cycle of copycat effects similar to those found in teen and other suicides. So they might not have been using the media contagion term, but that's what they were talking about. I am not the first to see this, but I want to be the last. What is going on? I, it's been two years since our paper kind of blew up and, and um, people started really talking about it and looking at it and the journalists started calling and the interviews came. 
uh, I don't know that I can say that it's better. I think in some place it is. There are some notable examples. The Daily Wire um, owner and founder has refused now to any more uh, use names or images of mass shooters. Um, Anderson Cooper is kind of a shining example of uh, taking on that challenge over five years ago when the Teves family asked him to stop uh, reporting names and faces um, because their son was killed in the Aurora, Colorado movie theater shooting. Um, there have been other examples of some organizations trying to curb that reporting to some degree. I think we're starting to see evidence of that, but we'd have to do some more content analyses to be sure. Um, it's not looking good overall. Uh, this is something we have to keep talking about when we get to prevention. How am I doing on time? Okay, maybe I'm rushing. <laughs> All right. So. We have some options here. There are things that we can do. Um, these are things that I really focused on when I talked to the Federal Commission on School Safety. They're looking at mass shootings in schools and what can be done. Um, we'll see where they land on that. There have been some interesting things going on there. But, uh, but I think you know, many of the commission panel members want to do everything that we can and want to understand what's going on. So. First and foremost, I say we remove the media contagion. Fame is what they're seeking. Take it away. Um, I like to say that it's that simple, but of course, journalists tend to argue that, well, well, we always report the who, what, where, when, why of a story. That that's the who. It's number one. It's how do we not report that? And it's a valid question. Um, but they've done it before. They show respect and restraint when talking about sexual assault cases. They remove the who from those stories. Um, they followed the guidelines that were set up in 1994 related to suicide contagion. We had a working group from the CDC put together recommendations for the media in that, that long ago. And so they show restraint. They uh, delay release of suicide results generally, although I've been seeing that trending in a different direction very recently. Um, they, but they kind of make it back page news or not mentioned at all and certainly not in national media. And that removes the who, but they can still tell the story about suicide and what are prevention efforts, what's important, what are warning signs, how do we engage. So they have done it before, and we can do it again, and we can ask them to do this. Um, it can be a voluntary adoption uh, without necessarily infringing on you know, their right to report and keep the public informed. But the other thing I wanted to say, and this kind of goes back to the profiling, there's not a lot more I think we're going to learn about shooters. We do now have hundreds of cases. We know what those cross-cutting traits are. Just because you know one news organization spends um, much, much time delving into w an individual's background does not mean we're going to prevent shootings in the future or be able to uh, figure out what went awry this time. It's pretty simple in some ways, and we know what we can do and what we should do already. Um, all right, so we, I advocate... You can choose either one. They're equally excellent. They have very similar messages. Don't name them. Both started by uh, uh, survivors of mass shootings, the Teves family, one of them, and a Columbine family, another. Don't name them. It's pretty simple. We talk about don't name them, don't show their picture. I would add don't go into detailed histories um, or manifestos of the shooters because that gives that would-be shooter who's watching something to hold on to. That parasocial relationship starts developing more deeply and they see an ally in this person if they can find out what was their in weapon choice and why did they love that weapon and um, you know what was their background and were they bullied and all these things. But it doesn't mean that the media hasn't been very helpful sometimes in figuring out where there have been institutional failures, where a child may not have been served appropriately or where a family fell through the cracks, but you can still talk about those things without revealing the specific identity. Um, I think we need to convene another working group. It doesn't seem to be working, all the traveling and the hundreds of interviews that I'm doing to get the press to collectively adopt some of the things. Let me give you an example. The Society for Professional Journalism, the Florida chapter, about two years ago had presentations from, I think, No Notoriety come in and victims of shootings and talking about media contagion. They almost unanimously adopted um, for the, their state journalism society uh, rule to, to adopt the No Notoriety campaign. Do you think they followed that in the last two years? They did not. Um, there's something going on that's very hard for them to make that final step. So we have to work 
at perhaps another level. But we are, colleagues and I are traveling, we're uh, hosting presentations with journalists at big conferences, doing what we can to educate that side of this issue. All right, what can each of you do and what can uh, professionals in schools or at universities do? Um, having clear policies about incident response, of course, is very important, but noticing the signs of suicidal ideation, paying attention when anyone leaks that kind of information. It's important, it matters, it's not a joke, even if they say that it is. Um, get someone to assess them, help them uh, recognize that there's help and support there, um, and it follow up. It also can't just be a one-time thing. You've got to keep checking in. There have to be professionals employed and available to check in with that person over a few months, over six months, over a year or more. Um, and lastly, and this isn't so much my area of expertise, I refer you to Dr. Schildkraut's book that has a number of good chapters on this, and there are other experts who write about it. Dr. Langford has some good studies on this as well. Uh, you know, we have the Australian example. There seem to be inroads that we could make with certain kinds of um, changes to our gun law policy, at least in the U.S. But again, I'll have to have you explore that in another avenue. All right, that's all I have for you for now. <laughs> Mm-hmm. All right. Is that, oh, it is on. Okay, good. Um, so, thank you very much. You bet. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Johnston for the, unfortunately, very timely, um, but very important and, and thought-provoking uh, talk. We're going to move into the question and answer portion of our afternoon. Um, so, please come to the mic. There's a mic set up in the middle of the room here. Um, for people to ask questions. We need you to come to the mic so we can all hear you clearly, but also so that it makes it onto the live stream and onto the archive for people who couldn't be here with us so that they can um, hear your question. If you do need a microphone brought to you instead of being able to make it to the mic, simply raise your hand and I'm happy to bring you a microphone so that you can uh, be part of things. So. We'll open up the floor to questions. I, I was wondering, uh, what's the political will, like, I mean, at a mm -hmm. specifically at a legal or policy level to, to even talk about this stuff? I mean, I'm assuming at the federal level, zero. But, like, I mean, I'm sure... I don't sure true, Well, okay, <laughs> but I'm sure s uh, my sense is that states would probably mm -hmm. take the lead on this. So wh what's... How is that shaping up these days? Well, I guess it depends on what aspect you're talking about. Are you asking more about, um, like, what journalists can do and news no, producers? No, no, no. I'm like lawmakers. Lawmakers. So that would probably be more related to the gun side of the debate, you know, that we think that's also a causal factor. Um, because we probably can't legislate what the media cover or don't. We, we, uh, at this point, we're looking at mostly making a recommendation, a strong recommendation coming from a public health organization saying this is a public health risk and we can take a fairly simple step to quickly work on this risk. I mean, the idea is that uh, if those contagion models are correct, that we could see a one-third to maybe one-half reduction of mass shootings in a fairly short period of time. Uh, we might be able to get back to pre-2000 levels, which was before the advent of 24-hour news cycles and social media and the internet, really. I think that's a major correlational connection here. So I if we're going to talk about mental health intervention, maybe that could be legislated, but it would probably just be access to guns or types of guns, age restrictions, things like that. I will point out, um, and I was reviewing in Dr. Schildkraut's book, that there have been court precedents um, about some of those issues al already, but I don't know that they're getting followed. So we may already have the laws in place, but can we hold people accountable to that and gun sellers and loopholes and things? Can we s hold up those rulings? Uh, thank you very much for your talk. You uh, why do men seem particularly susceptible to this type of contagion? Mm, good question. Well, we definitely know it's a genderized issue. You know, it's only about 5% of all mass shooters. There's a few varying tallies um, that are female. So, I mean, violence is a genderized issue. Violence is a men's issue by and large. Um, so we have to address it from all those different angles. Sociologists work on that systemically. Psychologists work on that individually. 
Um, you know, we work on that in domestic violence realms, um, in child abuse realms, all kinds of ways. Um, but I, I guess I would argue a little bit specific to mass shooting, the narcissistic piece, um, and that the box that I think sometimes men feel shoved in that you're, you, um, you're worth nothing if you're not exactly this kind of man in this way. And so when you take away that social capital and that feeling of belongingness, it, it, there's a tendency there if those other elements are in place as well. It's not enough on its own to maybe uh, push men more in that direction than women. They're also less likely to ask for help or believe that they need help, which is a problem. Hi, um, you said that journalists shouldn't name or show faces, but uh, how should they deal with like speculation on social media or if the name itself gets leaked? Yeah, it is, in this day and age, it's pretty hard to control these things, right? So it's a little bit up to us as individuals, but uh, I like what Dr. Um, Tufeksi, I think is how she said she's Turkish, um, her last name. What she talks about is that it's a different thing when it's splashed in mass media and everywhere, and that you've seen, like, remember the study of the images? You've seen in three days more than 9,000 images in just three online sites for newspapers. Um, we could really scale that back. So if we scale that back, and I'd like to see what happens next. Do we see an effect or not? If someone has to actually go looking and kind of searching for information and it's not national news, that's, that's how it was kind of pre-2000. And we still did have mass shooters. There were people who were going to do this probably almost no matter what we do. And they sought out that information and maybe became copycat killers, which is a bit of a different thing than contagion. So uh, probably we can't completely eradicate this, but having to search for and not having it everywhere and easily coming through your news feed on your phone every 15 minutes updates and things like that would, we believe, make a difference. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of, well, of course, probably have. A lot of the mass shooting that has been going on in the U.S. has been done by mainly white males. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have debated on how the media portrays them afterwards mm -hmm. by uh, seeing them as they were innocent before or they enjoyed this small uh, country music lifestyle, like the <laughs> shooter at the country show who shot from the hotel building. Mm -hmm. A lot of the media was saying how he was sweet before he did this, and then out of nowhere, he just had a mental breakdown. And a lot of people don't understand why they portray these mass shooters so innocent, especially mm -hmm. when they're white. Mm -hmm. And if it was any other person, like a black person who did something mm -hmm. like that, they're straight guilty. Or they have they were doing a lot of these bad things. So why is it that media always portrays the white male as a sweet, innocent person before doing something mm -hmm. so drastically evil? Well, I think you might know the answer to that. But yeah, I think there is some issue there. Um, it, we do, it's, it's not, com for better or worse, we are having more diversity among mass shooters than we did, say, even 20, 30 years ago. Um, so I think it's still in the range of about 66%, maybe about two-thirds are generally white American males, in the, since that's what I study is in the United States. Um, I guess I can't speak completely to how the media is portraying them. I haven't really like analyzed enough stories to compare against race, but I've heard certainly that there's that tendency um, and so, I don't know, I mean, it could be tied to a few things, I mean, just flat out racism. Um, and secondly, it could be tied to that we don't see that history of violence often in these men. Now, in the case that you brought up, there was history of domestic violence, at least m minorly. Um, but maybe the media is focusing on that, but using maybe the wrong terminology, innocent, or, you know, he just snapped, or something. Because um, actually, those shooters tend to plan their crimes very carefully. Um, they may have it mapped out for months. They'll often wait the requisite amount of time legally to buy guns and such before they do their crimes. Whereas other types of single homicide that might be more crimes of passion, in the moment something goes awry or there's kind of a rage outburst and then someone kills, um, those folks often do have a history that's led up to that. And that's not, I wouldn't always say their fault. There can be attachment things and societal things that have put them in that category. Um, and, th and people who are more affected by that are usually people of color and people who are suffering from poverty. So, so I don't know. I just don't know that the media is the best judge for us to make determinations about why people do things. You know, I think what you guys do here and what happens on college campuses and the kind of research we do is the best place to try to make those determinations. I don't know if that answered you well enough. But <laughs> So I think it's a very interesting idea for reducing violence to think about what we can do in the media to reduce it. 
So my question would be, thinking about different countries in the world where they have the same media, right? Mm -hmm. So if we go to Japan, <laughs> there's no argument that they actually pay, uh, play way more violent video games, probably more than any country in the world. They watch just as much violent TV. They are exposed to the same mass media that we are here. They see the mass shooters there, the names, but their violence historically in Japan right. has been one of the lowest in mm -hmm. history and continues to be. So regardless of how much violent video games they're watching, whether it's the men or the women, regardless of all the stuff that they're watching in the media, they are not committing mass shootings, mm -hmm. nor is actually almost every other country in the world which has implemented different policies. So it seems to be, to me, mm -hmm. more of a cultural thing, more of a systemic thing, mm -hmm. and this seems to me to be more of a US issue. And there are things going on in the United States that are leading to 10, 20, 30, 40 times more mass shootings than the rest of the world. You made a lot of great points there. I'll yeah, see if sorry, I can unpack I a few. No, it's OK. Um, one thing I would say is, yes, I think this is predominantly a US problem. I don't just think, but the statistics bear that out. Um, our media, I also think, uh, particularly our news media, how we portray the news has shifted a great deal since about, get ready for it, the year 2000. What happened in the year 2000? <laughs> as you recall, a shift happened in the number of mass shootings as well. So I sometimes when I talk with international media organizations, I'll say, you know, be careful, don't import our problem to you. <clears throat> What style of news do you have? Because when you talk, because there's another piece of what you said was about just violence in general, mediated violence. So it could be television or um, video game or movie, that kind of thing. We do know that that has an effect on aggression. It's probably about a 10% effect of all the causes of things that cause aggression. Some of my colleagues talk about not worrying about it so much because it's kind of a small contributor to overall aggression compared to many other things like poverty and injustice and um, resources and, um, and inborn genetic traits toward aggression, et cetera. But it does have an, a small effect on increasing aggression, but clearly not enough in most countries to override those social taboos. So what's going on with us is that, that I think that that type of violence doesn't transmit the contagion in the same way. News media of a, quote, real person who really did this, who I can identify with, I think transmits the contagion and not the other type of violence. Um, what else can I say? I wanted to say a couple other things about other countries. We do, this is correlational, but there's one other nation that has as many per capita mass shootings as we do, and that is Switzerland. And they are also the only other developed nation who has as many guns per capita as we do. Um, so you can look at how your news is portrayed. I think good news is boring news. I think it's not sensationalized and it's not for profit, but that's just me. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to go back to that. But yes, we went to a for-profit, you know, entertainment style news media model in the United States. And not all other countries have done that. I think that's something to look at as well. I, I had a question, actually. I was wondering. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other big trends that we see in media reporting on these kinds of incidents now is um, outpourings of support for the communities where it happened, uh, communities coming together, having candlelight vigils, um, things like that, and, and people actually um, trying to, for example, we saw this a lot in um, Florida, mm -hmm. right, um, where the uh, students who survived are actually becoming household names and, and certainly getting a lot of, of mm -hmm. media attention. Does that kind of maybe more pro-social media attention contribute to the problem, do you think? Or do you think it's actually perhaps maybe a, a responsible way of reporting on these? I think that's events? a very responsible way. Yeah, I think um, I'm really excited to see where this goes. It's incredible the power that youth have to rally these things. Uh, you guys have the power to do so many things and people will listen. Um, more so than to us, you know, the, the supposed experts. So, um, yeah, we, we, don't s we don't believe that there would be any, well, I guess I can't say for sure. I've, I've become a little concerned that just talking about mass shootings all the time I in any way moves it a little from the abnormal to the normal, and so then that could have its own contagion effect on somebody's mind, but I would hope that not in the same way at all as um, when we focus so much on the killers and make them anti-heroes. 
So if we don't do that and we talk about, yeah, the, the responses and the reactions of communities and their options and these pro-social efforts they're making, my guess is that can only be positive. Hi, Lynn. Hi. Um, do you ever think that mass shootings are an inside job? Can or you say more? Sure. Um, I did a lot of research about, it's not a mass shooting, but like 9-11 and such. And do you ever think mass shootings are a form of control um, or just for money? Uh, if there's a mass shooting, they want to up security, so more jobs. So do you ever think that mass shootings are for I that? I just want an opinion right. on it from you. Sure, you bet. Um, I think it's, a, it's an important question. I've never read a profile to date and a detailed life history of one of these men that indicated that to me. And maybe that has something to do with before I was a professor in psychology and studying media, I was a counselor for 15 years and working with individuals with various issues and mental health problems, et cetera. And they remind me so very much of my clients. They're, they're not unusual. They're not surprising in the kinds of struggles they're dealing with and how they're cope, choosing to cope with those struggles. So I don't see them very able to make friends, much less organize complicated plots that might help the country. Now, sometimes they believe that. You know, sometimes I, you, you will read sometimes that they've written that if I do this, it'll make the university do something different or it'll make my job place change a policy and I need to get rid of those bad people. And so there might be something in their somewhat delusional minds that they think they're helping <clears throat> a larger issue. But I guess I would just have to say flatly no <laughs> to the answer to your question. <coughs> Hi. Uh, so I wonder how the uh, the identifying factor, or rather, I'll ask the question like this: um, If you look at a lot of mass shootings in Europe, have involved uh, Islamistic terror groups or other religiously motivated uh, terror groups, and in the states, like we've seen anecdotally, there's been a lot of of uh, right wing motivated uh, Nazi affiliated. Uh, mm -hmm. shooters mm -hmm. and the uh, people carrying out these shootings have been like you said predominantly white males and they they get blasted on CNN with their mug shots or, or mm -hmm. profile pictures from their Facebook pages and such I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, how much that determines the media contagion so let's say that uh, a mass shooting like Dylan Roof for example he might it Will he be more, would that be more likely that he would influence people who are similar in age, race, social status, et cetera? Or mm -hmm. does, does that, and, and equally with the people who have carried out, uh, you know, the attacks in Paris, for example, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in the name of religion. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Okay, thank you. Um, so we know that um, mass death can occur through more of a terrorist type of plot versus an individual designed plot. And there are some overlaps in what happens there, but we think they're fairly different. The one thing they seem to share, and this will be Dr. Langford's work on um, rampage versus terrorist um, bombers and yeah, rampage style killings and what are the overlaps or not. And one of the things that he found is that that suicidal ideation carries through. So even when organizations are recruiting people to maybe do these acts for them, if that's how it went down, um, they're looking for someone who is feeling probably on the edge of life and death already and is willing to die maybe for no reason related to their cause but could be convinced to that. Um, people that are socially isolated or don't have much to live for or have that loss of social capital have been identified as some of these um, suicide bombers and things. So that's important to look at. It's like you're at risk for a number of things if you're in that space of mind. Um, yes, will people identify with them if they can see something in their background? Or yeah, I too ha share that idea or I too am racist or whatever and I um, can identify with them. They might be more likely to do it. Um, there was something else I wanted to kind of address with what you were saying. The, I think the, one of the other good references to look at is Madfis and Levin. They talk about aggrieved entitlement um, and that 
again, it's mostly a male issue, but this idea that if you are of a class of people and a background or an ethnicity that normally enjoys privilege in your society, and then you feel you're being denied that, so you're a white male who normally has lots of privilege in this world and can um, kind of dominate others, and you're not feeling that, and you're not feeling dominant, then, then yes, they seem to be susceptible to groups that would argue that you sh this is your rightful place and you should have this, and so they might adopt those ideologies. But that aggrieved entitlement could lead to either one, to terrorist types of attacks and being deeply involved in a group like that, or on your own, thinking I'm gonna get back what's my rightful due. Does that make sense? Not that I agree with that, I'm, I'm just describing what might be going through their minds. <laughs> okay. Okay, great questions. Thank you so much for your attention and participation. Uh, I'm gonna invite everyone to stick around for a reception. We have a light lunch and we can mingle and continue to discuss this. Um, amongst ourselves, and please join me in once again thanking Dr. Johnston for uh, sharing her expertise with us here today. <laughs>